Straight ahead, done deal, but unfinished business. Attorney General Ken Paxson's state criminal case is almost over, but the special prosecutors say Collin County still owes them hundreds of thousands of dollars each. I will never do work for the state of Texas again unless I'm paid up front in advance. It is the most untrustworthy client I've had in 42 years. One step closer, Brandon Gill is the favorite to become the next congressman representing the 26th district in North Texas. How he defeated 10 other Republicans in the primary. Gill sat down with me to talk about his priorities in Congress. New mission, retired Lieutenant Colonel Allen West discusses his big victory as Dallas County GOP chair and the number one concern facing the local Republican party. Republicans have really lacked focus in the urban uh, population centers, our major cities. Good Sunday morning, I'm Jack Fink. Get your fix for Texas politics. Eye on Politics starts now. Hello and welcome to Ion Politics. Happy Easter. Hope you're having a great weekend. After 10 years, Attorney General Ken Paxson is putting his criminal case behind him without facing trial. Indicted in 2015 on state securities fraud charges, Paxson's case had been repeatedly delayed because of pay disputes, changes of venue, and legal back and forth. But last week, he agreed to a deal without admitting any guilt. Morning, General. Any comment? Attorney General Ken Paxton walked into a Houston courtroom without saying anything about the deal he struck with the special state prosecutors that will allow him to avoid a criminal trial and eventually have the felony charges against him dropped. To make that happen, Paxton agreed to terms of the deal, called a pretrial diversion over the next 18 months. He'll have to pay more than $270,000 in restitution to the victims related to the state securities fraud charges. Paxton will also have to perform 100 hours of community service in Collin County, which the prosecutor said may involve spending time at a food pantry or soup kitchen. The AG will also have to check in with prosecutors virtually every 60 days. I did everything. At a news conference after the court hearing, Special Prosecutor Brian Weiss revealed he's been inundated with sharp criticism from the members of the public who heard about the potential deal late last week. When to them I say, I appreciate your concern, uh, and with all due respect, your truth is not the truth. Paxton released a statement saying, quote, I look forward to putting this behind me. I want to thank my family, team, and supporters for sticking by my side. Dealing with a 10-year case looming over our heads was no easy task. I am glad to move on and will provide further comment in the weeks ahead. There is no admission of guilt. There will never be an admission of guilt because he's not guilty. The charges stem from the time before Paxton was elected attorney general in 2014. The special prosecutor said Paxton received a deal that's very common for people with no criminal history. This defendant was treated fairly with dignity and respect. That Ken Paxton would have never been prosecuted in this case but for his being the attorney general. On the failure to register case, he's the only person in history that was prosecuted criminally. Judge Andrea Bell said she was not part of this deal and that it was only between the prosecutors and Paxton's legal team. She warned that if Paxton violates any terms of the agreement, he will face a very speedy trial. We spoke with Ken Schaefer, who until six weeks ago was also a special state prosecutor in the case. We asked him if Texans should be surprised that Paxton will be able to avoid jail time. No, they shouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, look. It, when we indicted this case, we understood there's a very realistic possibility that even if Paxton was convicted, a jury probably wouldn't put him in prison. He'd be a convicted felon, but we always assumed he would probably get probation. And the reason why is that typically, especially in, in larger counties like Harris County, even Collin County, Dallas County, Travis County, most of the time for a first offender on a nonviolent offense, um, juries are going to give probation unless there's something particularly heinous about the case. Well, the case we were going to trial on first was failure to register as a uh, security advisor representative, which is a regulatory violation. It's criminal, but it's a regulatory matter. Nobody lost money. He 
failed to file forms that he was required to file by law, and because of that, he committed a felony. But that's one of those things that I, I think, you know, we always assumed a jury would think, well, nobody was really harmed. It is a criminal violation, so let's give him probation. Let's not put him in prison for that. And what about the other securities fraud charges? Securities fraud is a little different, but, but that case has changed over the years. How so? Well, number one, one of the complainants died. Uh, there were two separate securities fraud charges. One involved a man named uh, Hochberg, the other one uh, was Byron Cook. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Hochberg is dead. Um, he died a couple years ago, so that case is gone. So there's one securities fraud case left. The securities fraud is not that, can, the allegation is not that he lied to somebody to get them to invest and they lost money as a result of that lie, but rather it's a crime of omission. And that means that he failed to disclose something that we contend he's legally obligated to disclose. And had he disclosed that, there's a chance that the person would not have invested their money. What was the disclosure? That he was getting a commission off of investment. So he was, in essence, going to his friends, touting an investment, telling them what a great opportunity it is to get involved, that they really needed to invest in it. Well, they agreed to invest. They did. What they didn't realize is he wasn't also investing, as he had in the past in their joint deals, but rather he would get a 10% commission off every dollar they invested. So he would get shares of stock every time they would purchase stock. And, you know, at least one, Byron Cook and, and Mr. Hochberg both, said had we known that he wasn't investing his own money, but instead he's making money off of our investment, there's no way we would have done it. So that's fraud by omission. Schaefer told us there is still some unfinished business. He says Collin County still owes him more than $210,000 for his work on the case. Hours that I billed that uh, the judge ordered uh, Collin County to pay, but now it's on appeal, it's probably around $60,000. There's probably another $150,000 or more um, that I haven't even billed yet because there's no point in billing it knowing that we're still litigating uh, the, two, you know, the uh, payment from seven years ago. So we haven't been paying this case in eight years. And every year it's taking more and more and more time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually costing me money to prosecute the case, which is the reason that I told the judge if she wasn't going to delay the case in order to let the Court of Appeals rule on the payment issue, then I'm prepared to withdraw from the case. I can't, I can't keep financing the Ken Paxton prosecution. I don't like the man, but I don't dislike him enough that I'm going to spend $100 or $2,000 to prosecute him. Last question, if you had to do this all over again, knowing what you know, would you have signed up for the case? I will never do work for the state of Texas again unless I'm paid up front in advance. It is the most untrustworthy client I've had in 42 years of representing a lot of charlatans, a lot of rogues, a lot of hardened criminals, and they are more honorable than the state of Texas. Current special state prosecutor Brian Weiss told me Collin County still owes him about $250,000 for the work he's done on the case. The issue is tied up on appeal. I called Collin County about this and a spokesman said they were not going to comment. We also reached out to Commissioner's Court Judge Chris Hill, but we didn't hear back. The county has not paid the prosecutors since 2016, saying the fees they were originally promised by the first judge in the case are too high and inconsistent with the county's policies. As for Paxton, he is reportedly still under federal investigation after his former top lieutenants went to the FBI more than three years ago, making allegations of potential bribery against him. They were fired, and some of them have filed a whistleblower lawsuit against Paxton, which is making its way through the courts. Paxton has denied any wrongdoing. Here's a look at some of the other political issues making headlines in Texas. Texas's new immigration law remains on hold after a three-judge panel at the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued another ruling last week that Senate Bill 4 still can't take effect. Next up, an April 3rd court hearing to help determine whether the state's new law is constitutional. 
For the first time since overturning Roe v. Wade, the U.S. Supreme Court is considering an abortion case, this time whether to restrict sales of the abortion pill Mifepristone. The justices held a hearing Tuesday. Last year, a federal judge in Amarillo, Texas, put sales of the medication on hold after ruling the FDA didn't do a good enough job of studying how safe it is. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed the FDA improperly expanded access to the drug, but kept the agency's original approval in place. The Supreme Court should issue a ruling by the end of June. Governor Greg Abbott has issued an executive order to fight against an increase in anti-Semitic acts on college and university campuses in Texas. The order requires that all colleges and universities in the state review their free speech policies to establish appropriate punishments for anti-Semitic rhetoric, make sure the policies are enforced, and include the definition of anti-Semitism in free speech policies. The Texas chapter of the Council on American-Islamic Relations, or CARE, says it, quote, vehemently condemns the governor's executive order, calling it an unconstitutional overreach. Governor Abbott's order comes after someone vandalized the Hillel Jewish Organization's property last week at UT Austin by spray painting, quote, free Palestine on it. And coming up on Ion Politics, Republican Brandon Gill tells us how he beat 10 other candidates and won the GOP primary outright for the 26th Congressional District. And later, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, just elected chair of the Dallas County Republican Party, tells us the number one concern facing the local GOP. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Ion Politics. Republican newcomer Brandon Gill may have surprised a lot of people earlier this month when he defeated 10 other candidates to win the Republican primary outright for the 26th Congressional District. The district is now represented by Dr. Michael Burgess, who's retiring at the end of the year after more than 20 years in Congress. It's a Republican majority district and will likely remain that way in November. We asked Gill how he was able to avoid a runoff as well as his priorities. Listen, we, we ran a very data-driven campaign, and we knew going into March 5th that things were looking really good for us. You know, at the end of the day, what the people of Texas 26 are looking for is a conservative fighter. They're looking for somebody who's going to defend President Trump, somebody who's going to fight to secure the southern border and to rein in wasteful spending in Washington. And I was endorsed by President Trump. I was endorsed by Senator Cruz and the House Freedom Fund, which is the political wing of the Freedom Caucus. And that's exactly what the people of Texas 26 are looking for. And we made sure that they knew that I am a conservative fighter. Um, we had over $2 million spent in attack ads against me from D.C. swamp super PACs telling lies about me. But the people could see through it. What was it about your message, do you think, that most resonated with the voters? I think the, the number one issue, and, and you might even say the issue right now, is the border. Um, we have had millions upon millions upon millions of illegal aliens flooding into this country under the Biden administration. And I think over the past three years, it's become extremely clear to everybody who's paying attention that the border crisis is intentional that we had a secure border under President Trump, just looking at it very simplistically, as soon as Joe Biden got elected, as soon as he got into office, he got rid of every major border control policy that President Trump had in place. So you talked about the border. What is your solution? If you were, you know, once, mm -hmm. if and when you're elected, it's obviously a Republican majority district. Yep. Um, so what would your solution be? What would you propose when you get to Washington? I think first we've got to go back to the Trump era policies that were working. So we've got to bring back Remain in Mexico. We've got to reform our asylum laws. We've got to finish construction of the border wall. What are your other priorities aside from the border? I think that we've got to rain, get Washington out of uh, interfering in, in everyday personal liberties and we've got to cut wasteful spending. I mean, it has been, we've, we've been running up a deficit for year after year after year, decade after decade, and we've got to cut wasteful spending. Um, you mentioned abortion, and I know Democrats are making this a, a campaign issue uh, mm -hmm. nationally and here in Texas. And uh, I don't suppose you agree with them on codifying Roe v. Wade, but I'm wondering on the flip side, mm -hmm. do you support a national ban, or is this something you would prefer 
the states to decide for themselves, or is there something else? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, to be very clear, I am 100% pro-life. That's been a big priority for both my wife and me. In fact, my wife, Danielle, wrote a book about abortion where she systematically debunks the left's pro-abortion arguments. So I think that the goal legislatively should be to save lives, save innocent babies from being slaughtered. Does that mean you would support a national ban, or is that something you prefer the states to handle? I would take a look at it. I mean, again, I think that the goal is to save innocent lives. Up next, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, who won the race for Dallas County GOP chair, tells us what he believes is the local party's biggest challenge when Ion Politics comes right back. Attorney General Ken Paxson's latest lawsuit against the Biden administration is over liquefied natural gas. At the beginning of the year, Biden and the Department of Energy announced a pause on approving new exports of liquefied natural gas to countries without free trade agreements. The U.S. is a world leader in natural gas production, and Texas is the country's leading producer of both crude oil and natural gas. According to the White House, U.S. exports of liquid natural gas are expected to double by the end of this decade, and the potential increased cost of energy for Americans as well as the, quote, perilous impacts of methane have not been taken into account. Paxton's lawsuit states there is currently a shale gas boom in the U.S., which increases opportunities for natural gas production and could drive billions of dollars in investments to Texas. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West has a new mission. Dallas County Republicans elected him as their new GOP chair earlier this month, and he will succeed Jennifer Stoddard Hoydu. I sat down with West and we discussed his concerns facing the local party, his priorities, and a big jump he has planned to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day. I think that people just were looking for a principal message that looked at the issues that we have here. You go back to 2020 in the last presidential election cycle, Democrats outvoting Republicans by 291,076 votes and being able to talk about the situation we have with lack of precinct chairs and also the lack of the, you know, Dallas County having elected Republicans in the leadership. And folks just want to hear a plan and folks want to hear sincerely what they can do to be a part of that in turning this around. So what is your plan to turn this around? Because as you said, mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, Dallas County has no leader, has no elected Republicans mm -hmm. in the county level as far as commissioner's court. Yes. And at the state level, there's only two state representatives who yeah. are Republicans. Well, I got to tell you, one of the things that I've noticed from being a member of Congress to having been the state party chairman is that Republicans have really lacked focus in the urban uh, population centers, our major cities. And you can see that across the country, where even in a red state, a lot of the, uh, the cities are run by the Democrats. And I think it's time for us to focus. You look at this election cycle right now, no one running for sheriff from the Republican Party side, no one running for tax assessor. Uh, we do have someone running for county commission seat one, but no one running in the other county commission seat and a lot of judges not running. So I think it's about candidate recruitment, training. I think another thing that we have to do is a better job with going out and filling these precinct chairs. As far as the biggest challenge you believe that you are facing and the, and the Dallas County GOP is mm -hmm. facing, what would that be? I think is the belief that we can start you know, moving toward restoring this party back to where it used to be. Uh, I think it was 2004 was the last time in the presidential election cycle when Republicans outvoted Democrats. Let's talk on a personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking before and you were telling me that you are going to be jumping out of a plane for D-Day on June 6th. Yeah, you know, in my military career, I, I was a paratrooper and I got a master rating as a, a paratrooper. and. I got the opportunity, uh, Bill Markham, who heads up the Round Canopy Parachute Team, uh, met me in December at the airport in Jacksonville, Florida, after I spoke at a veterans event. And he invited me to be a part of their organization and also offered me an opportunity to jump into Normandy. And, and you talk about bucket lists of bucket lists. I mean, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, uh, there are many of those young men that are not gonna be around for another one or two years. And I give you a great case in point, Ray Lambert, who uh, passed away about three years ago, dear friend of mine, landed uh, on Utah, uh, Omaha Beach, I'm sorry, 16th Infantry Regiment, 1st Infantry Division, which I served in in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So we've got to tell those stories. And that's what uh, this Round Canopy Parachute Team is all about, commemorating the exploits of those men who 
liberated an entire continent away from uh, National Socialism. And to be able to fly across the English Channel in a C-47 aircraft and hook up on the same cable line, static uh, cable hook line that they hooked up on, it just doesn't get any better than that, especially when I remember that my dad served in World War II. And we wish him well on that jump. Before we go, a solid start to the season for our defending world champion Texas Rangers. They won a close one opening day against the Chicago Cubs. Among those in attendance at Thursday's game, Congressman Roger Williams of Arlington. He presented the Rangers with a flag that flew over the U.S. Capitol on November 1st, the night the Rangers became World Series champs. Governor Greg Abbott was also there. He presented the baseball for the ceremonial first pitch. And former President and Governor George W. Bush was also there. Here's a photo our Jet Beecham snapped. That's all for Eye on Politics this week. I'm Jack Fink. I am listening and we are listening at CBS News Texas. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again next week.